Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Trick, and it's my honor to be the dean here at Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar. Welcome to today's Dean's Lecture Series. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce a longtime friend of CMUQ, His Excellency Sheikh Abdullah bin Saud Al Thani, the governor of the uh, Qatar Central Bank. Sheikh Abdullah first came to speak at CMUQ in March 2014 has been here multiple times since, always to share his perspectives on the Qatar financial policy. We very much appreciate Sheikh Abdullah's dedication to our community and for making time in his busy schedule to share his wisdom and insight. Sheikh Abdullah began his career at the Qatar Central Bank in 1981, serving as deputy governor from 1990 to 2001. He left the bank to serve as chairman of the State Audit Bureau and returned in 2006 when he was appointed governor. Sheikh Abdullah is an expert in many facets of Qatar's financial sector. He is chairman of the board of directors of the QFC Regulatory Authority, the Qatar Financial Markets Authority, the Financial Stability and Risk Control Committee, and the Qatar Development Bank. Today, Sheikh Abdullah will be speaking about opportunities and challenges that FinTech presents for Qatar and the MENA region. So before I invite uh, Sheikh Abdullah to the podium, I'd like to take a few minutes to greet members of the media. Welcome. We are so happy that you are here, and we very much value having you come join us today. As you know, we've reserved the question and answer period for members of our academic community. If you would like to ask specific questions of Sheikh Abdullah, he will be pleased to speak with you as we break for lunch. Would everybody now please join me in welcoming Sheikh Abdullah to the Dean's Lecture Series. Good afternoon, everybody. First, thank you, everyone, for coming and inviting me again for this speaker series. I always enjoy my visit here to share my thought and then have a discussion with the faculty and the student. On behalf of my board of director of the Central Bank and the people who work in the Central Bank and me, I would like to thank the dean and the faculty to share ideas from the policy makers like us who interact with the financial market players on a daily basis. As the central bank in the country, we are responsible for various areas, such as monetary policy, financial stability, payment system, and public debt management. We are also involved in collecting, analyzing credit information through the Qatar Credit Bureau. I hope my talk here today will raise some interesting questions for you to think over. As you can see in the chart, it is 10 years since the financial crisis. Although the world economy has recovered, but downside risk still exists. As we all know, central banks played an important role in addressing the challenges through a coordinating policies action. The global financial system has become much stronger through a wide range of financial reform. Global economy growth was 3.7% in 2017. It was a broad base with a strong growth in both advanced and emerging economy. According to IMF, global growth is projected to be 3.7% in both 2018 and 2019. Growth in advanced economy is projected to be 2.1 in 2019, with the U.S. showing solid growth, while some other region showing less robust growth. Growth will be quite robust in the emerging and development economy, with the real GDP growth expected to be 4.7 in both 2018 and 2019. This, however, does not take into account the recent trade development, and their impact on the growth is still unclear. So the question is, does this affect growth in our region? 
The data show the oil prices are quite uncertain, and therefore the effect on the growth is less obvious. Thankfully, however, oil prices has been quite firm during the last one and a half years. At the same time, global financial conditions are, are seeing upward pressure, raising borrowing costs across the world. Currently, the upper bound of Fed rate is 2.25%, and there are expectations of one more rate increase by the end of this year. As we can see, growth has been recovering in the GCC thanks to higher oil prices. Although these growth rates are lower than that seen during the 2000 until 2010, the region is now getting used to 1% to 4% real GDP growth. And non-oil GDP need to grow in order to sustain this growth. The IMF predicts real GDP growth to be 2.4% in 2018 and 2.7% 2 in 2019 for the MENA region. Interestingly, the MENA oil importing country have seen a stronger growth. But this growth has been fragile due to the uncertain geopolitical condition. These, con these countries are expected to grow at around 5% during the next few years. That said, the region has not fully benefited from the global growth, upswing that has been happening recently. This is reflecting in the chart, which show that growth in the region has been relatively lower as compared to the global growth. In addition, the GDP per capita has been going down when MENA countries are compared to its peers. Growth has been held back by a combination of high leverage, fiscal consolidation, as well as conflict and geopolit geopolitical risk. As the chart shows, the cumulative fiscal deficit in the region is rising. And for several countries, a big part of the debt is maturing over the next several years. This could put pressures on their public financing. Moving to the banking sector in the MENA, the sector is generally healthy with capital adequacy ratio at a good level. Although non-performing loans in some countries remain quite high, this is one key challenge for policymakers to tackle. After a period of liquidity challenge, the situation in the GCC has been improving which could spill well for our business and wider economy. From the chart, you will see that after a decline in 2015, total deposit has increased in 2016 and 2017 due to an increase in government deposit. As a result, the loan to deposit ratios after increasing in late 2016 has since moderated. However, the region is experienced a rise in the cost of borrowing, which is expecting to impact credit growth. The IMF project the average Fed fund rate to be 1.9 in 2018, as compared with 1% in 2017. As we see in the chart, this is putting pressures on the credit growth, especially private credit to household and corporate. After increasing in 2015, Private credit growth has been scheduled in 2017, reflecting, among other, weak consumer demand and lower confidence. Surely, this is a something we do not want to hear. In this situation, the MENA region faces a challenge in funding its businesses. This call for expanding growth through financial inclusion. As we see from the chart, the level of financial inclusion in MENA are quite low. Lending to small and medium-sized businesses also need to improve. If we are to develop our non-oil sectors, it is important to assure adequate funding is available for small business and medium, which are a key driver for economic growth. Not surprisingly, therefore, the region's core quite low not only in terms of getting credit, 
but also in terms of coverage of credit information. For example, among a high-income country, the percent of adults covered by credit registry in MENA is less than 15%, as compared with a close to 20% in the rest of the world. A key task for policymakers in the near term is to address these challenges. A good thing in the region is the focus on the financial technology. However, as the charts show five years financial technology investment in the Middle East region is less than 2% of total global investment in the financial technology. There are several reasons for this, including regulation, investment, and infrastructure, as well as human capital, not to mention funding challenge. Let me spend the next couple of minutes on the financial technology. As the charts show, at Qatar Central Bank, we will be looking at the financial technology through classification of financial technology by primary economic function and how it helps us. As the chart show, financial technology credit globally is still small. However, the lack of good quality data from the MENA country make it difficult to make any clear analysis at this point. There are, however, indications that this number is growing fast, especially in the development country. Why is that? I can suggest several reasons for this. If you look at this chart, we find that China financial technology has taken over consumer and business lending, while in the U.S. it is mainly focused in the consumer lending. On the other hand, in the U.K., it is a mix of business consumer and real estate. This is a quite a nice mix and show that, that companies and individuals have recognized the benefit of the financial technology. This is, however, not the case in the MENA region. And unless there is a big change in the culture, it might not take off on a large scale. This, the next question we need to ask is, who is funding these loans for the financial technology? As the chart shows, depending on the region, these loans are funding mostly by institution, especially business and corporation. This is not the case in the MENA, where such investments are considered risky and therefore not considered to be viable option for banks. More interestingly, in some region, private lenders are pushing the financial technology agenda. At this point, the MENA region perhaps does not have the volume or risk tolerance to push the financial technology agenda. Therefore, unless we first address the problem of risk tolerance and education and get more private entity to take this up, it might not become as popular as in developed country. Another issue in the context is a cross-border lending. As you can see in the chart, in the Asian Pacific region, excluding China, the share of cross-border lending is quite high, although it is much lower in America. At present, such lending in the MENA region is almost limited. Financial technology can enable also Islamic finance to attract more customers lower cost, and offer a wider range of products. Although there are several risks, this can also help the sector become more competitive. U.S. firm Bluesome Finance, for example, is expecting to launch the first digital Sukuk in late 2018. Retail investors will be able to invest in the Sukuk which will use the money to fund Sharia compliance microfinancing initiative. Can we, as a region, make a financial technology work for, uh, for all of us? As the chart show there, there is not much tendency for individuals to use business-to-business -business platform in the MENA region, as compared with the global average. Further studies will need to be done as why that is the case. 
I hope my video have raised some interesting among interest among you. I look forward to take some question from the audience here. So thank you very much. Maybe I'll take some question if somebody interest to have a question. I was just wondering about the the, the inter-border lending. You, sorry, everybody's spinning. The inter-border lending that you mentioned is part of that limited because people are concerned about the legal framework under which they can recover their loan if the person doesn't pay. Or I mean, what are the what makes countries averse to inter inter-border lending? Well, you know, when you come to small, medium-sized businesses, you know, the collateralization is so difficult that banks is to provide these loans. But also the challenge of this also, the cabinet of legality and other challenge of the type of these small medium businesses, especially in the financial technology, is need to reform a certain way of financing. Like us now in the Qatar Development Bank, we are studying also to provide loan to small medium size in addition to that, we are creating an incubator for the entrepreneur who also can work their, their work, you know, processes and also get some seed funding from the Qatar Development Bank. Thank you. Any other? Yes, sir. Interested to hear that uh, you, you made a case for uh, the importance of education uh, with fintech. And you also said that the uh, the financial sector here, the banks were very risk averse to sort of step into it. Uh, given the two subsets of the banking system here, Islamic banking and conventional banking, do you see a greater need with either one or the greater need with both of those subsectors for fintech? I understand your question, the separation of these two banking, Islamic and conventional, they work separately. Yes. And the conventional now, they don't have any kind of business in the Islamic. The reason behind that, if you have one conventional bank doing the two businesses, my capital adequacy should be double. My loan to deposit ratio should be also, you know, looked at it differently based in the loan type. Because the loan definition in the Islamic side is different than, you know, commercial side. So if the loan which is given to individual or corporate or public sectors, the definition in the Islamic is murabaha mudaraba istisna'a, where it's not easy to merge the names. And also in the type of the loans, where is murabaha mudaraba goes together in a definition, you cannot have one conventional doing also Islamic and they are also in the consolidation is very difficult. So for us here in the Qatar, we, we try to separate these two type of things. But there are big opportunity, what I said, in the financial technology. Today we are moving an era where is, all the banking sector is gonna change in providing loans and doing business. So financial technology has become opportunity in the payment system, and the remittance and other businesses. So there is a good environment for the financial technology to become a good platform here in Qatar. And, and I, what, was, what we see now, there is, there is a company now in the US will create a platform by the end of this year for the Sukuk area. And that's to provide money for the micro, small and medium businesses and also entrepreneurs. And that's something is also is generate some growth in the market. Thank you for uh, a very rich uh, presentation. My question is about fintech. Um, uh, does you know are, are Qatari banks ready to deal with fintech challenges? And does central bank you know have a plan to you know promote this and encourage Qatari banks to uh, to deal more with uh, fintech technologies? Yes, this is a very good question. You know we have been for a period of time studying this financial technology aspect. As a central bank, we are looking, there are so many types of model in this world. If you look to US and 
UK and other countries, they have different type of models of financial technology. We will take the initiative of creating the sandbox in the central bank. But also to create a sandbox, you need to create the right framework of regulatories. And also, we would like to have also the more secure work and providing business for the market and the ones who is really going to join this sandbox. In the same times, we are letting the banking now for a while to, to, to create a lot of these financial uh, instrument and financial technology. But in addition, in the other hand, we have seen also in my, there is an incubator here in Qatar for the entrepreneur who coming from the, this university. This entrepreneur is developing a lot of the base for the financial technology. But also the banking sectors and the market should create a platform for the loans, for the, for the product which they are serving the clients. So I think we are moving very quickly and you will hear this something about it before the end of this year. Thank you. One more question. I just wonder that you said that in uh, non-China Asia, the growth of financial technology has been more prominent even than in North America and parts of Europe. Are there things that uh, may be useful to you in looking at though that region in particular and how it's developing its financial technology products and services that could be beneficial in the MENA region? These experiences will taking well taking for us and they have a very good product in their market and they are well, it's they are more than welcome but the, you know there are what we see now there is some kind of integration between these products and they are some of them is here in the market we haven't we haven't seen the virtual currencies or the ledger type but we have seen the product which is available in the app and others, where it's good, giving a lot of services for the client, you know, in the household or consumer or whatever. So we see there is a development, but yes, we are taking all the experience of this region and also the product which they have as something which is very important for us. Thank you. We have this memento of your talk today to add to your now extensive collection.